try your very best story. Have you, have, who's got a story? You, you all must have a story that is, is your winning anecdote, your dinner party story, the one that people always say, tell that one. Who wants to kick off? There must be a good one from you Shall all. Shall I go with my Andrew Lloyd Webber story? Go for it. Well, it was um, Andrew Lloyd Webber's 50th birthday and he was having a party at uh, Annabelle's in Berkeley Square. And I was working with him um, and Michael Ball on the aspects of Love Launch for the album and got really close with Andrew. I, I, I don't know if anyone knows him, but he's actually a lovely, lovely guy. Uh, and he invited me to his party. And so I went, turned up at the party, got into the door, and there's a guy at the door, big, big, big guy, says, sorry, who are you? And I said, my name's Steve Payne. And he said to me, oh, yeah, you're Polydor Records, head of promotion. And I thought, how does he know that without even asking me a question? So, Walk in, walk into party, go to the top table. There's Andrew sitting there and he said, oh, Steve, how are you, mate? All right. I said, yeah, I'm really good. He said, you know the people on the table, don't you? I said, well, I know Sarah, Sarah Brightman, um, you know, because I've been working with Sarah as well. And there's a couple of other people from the really useful company. And he said, do you know the gentleman on my, my left here? And I said, well, yes, I, I, of course I know who you are. He said, uh, he said, and Andrew said, well, who is he then? I said, well, it's Prince, Prince Edward, isn't it? And Edward looked at him and he went, Steve, you know me as that useless fucking cunt. And I said, I'm sorry. So, uh, really, what did you mean? Well, for the years I've been working with Andrew, he was working at the really useful company, and I used to have to deal with this useless fucking cunt called Edward, who got everything wrong all the time. And uh, after that, we actually got on quite well. We had a chat, but that's my um, <laughs> story, really. Edit, edit, edit. <laughs> well, I know, yes, I'm sorry about that, but yeah, but it's a, it was a true story. <laughs> So there you go. Thank you very much. Um, so, Tony, have you got uh, – what's your very, very best story? Oh, God, I'm, I'm very unprepared for this. Um, well, there was one story. I mean, uh, we were kind of known as a band that did the wrong things and said the wrong things at the wrong time. And, uh, I, in fact, I'm going to write a guide to how to totally screw up your rock and roll career, just following what we did. And uh, there, there was one occasion, um, this, this actually involved the Marquee Club because we had a residency on Sunday nights over a month. And uh, I, I would just come up with some totally inappropriate idea and, uh, and get the rest of the band to go along with it. Now, the background of this story is that um, I, I came home to my, my room in, my, in a flat and, that I was sharing with other people. And I looked at, in my, at my bed and I was surprised. It looked like somebody was sleeping there. And I pulled the covers back and was horrified to see it was an, a fully inflated, inflatable doll. Mm. And, uh, I, and I just thought oh, it, it was slightly horrific because I really wasn't expecting it. But I, 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 I deflated it and chucked it in a cupboard. And one Sunday morning, I remember getting up and thinking, oh, let's do something really outrageous tonight. I'll blow up the doll and, uh, and take it out on stage and, and then cover it with tomato ketchup and beat it with a ukulele, um, which was a kind of bizarre idea. But it kind of amused me at the time. And so we, we were halfway through it. And I suddenly realized what I was doing was, was so inappropriate and so wrong. And, um, and we had a drummer called Charles Haywood who was sitting in for us. And he, 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 was, he was a fairly legendary avant-garde drummer. And he just suddenly got up and he stormed off. And, and afterwards, I had to placate him. I said, look, man, I, I'm really sorry. I made a very bad decision there. I realised what, what it looked like. I, and I didn't intend that. But he, he stormed off, apparently, because he got some tomato ketchup on his bass drum skin. Nothing to do with the, the, the totally inappropriate behaviour on my part. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there, there's one story amongst many others in the Naked City.
I'm sure we'll have some more soon. We, we welcome Dennis. We, we, um, we were talking just now about uh, our musical heroes and people sharing stories about, you know, have they ever met or worked with their heroes and did they, did they live up to expectations? Uh, any, any heroes of yours growing up that you eventually met or worked with? Did, yeah, did, they, did. Uh, did they disappoint or were they amazing? Well, uh, I did. I met Georgie Fame was the biggest influence on me. Um, I first heard him in about 65. I finally got to meet him at a strange gig at the Palladium. I was managing a jazz group. Steve White, who was the drummer of the Style Council, had a jazz group. And we were on the bill with, um, I think, Soft Cell were top of the bill, and Georgie Fame was on. And I was really, you know, I, I mean... I went out and bought a Hammond organ when I was 18 because I wanted to be the Jimmy Smith of Plumstead. Didn't quite work out, but I thought, you Have know, you still got the hernia? Influence. I say, have you still got the hernia? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I just added, I, I couldn't have it in my house because I had to buy it on the knock. And I couldn't tell my father because my father would never have allowed me to buy it. <laughs> so I got... Uh, my music teacher signed it, the HP agreement. And so it was, I had it around the friend's house. He lived in a huge house and they had so many empty rooms. So I parked it around there. And basically I spent two years taking lessons only to find out I was pretty rubbish. <laughs> what I, happened to it? <laughs> I speak as a good A&R man there. What happened to the organ? I flogged it. I sold it for exactly what I paid for it. I actually got me money back. Well, Hammonds in those days, I mean, I imagine now they, they held their price. I mean, it was, it, it literally hadn't moved out the house. So it had never been knocked about. And when I finally got to meet Fame, I mean, I took all my albums and he was really a miserable soul. I've got to be honest. I mean, I know now because, well, I know the history about the 60s. I don't think he made a lot of money. Um, I think he was fairly bitter about certain things that went on. And I literally gave him the albums, and he just scribbled Georgie Fame on them, and that was it. And we chatted for about five minutes, but I, it was, really wasn't... I was really disappointed. I mean, I shouldn't be, because by then I'd met loads of famous people, so... Uh, but it did sort of, because he was such a huge influence on me. I mean, I wouldn't have gone into the record business if I'd have never heard him. If I hadn't have heard him, then... I would have done something else. I'm still reeling from the fact that there was a gig where Soft Cell and Georgie Fame were on the side. Yeah, I, it, I can't remember the rest of the bill. Um, it was a jazz gig, uh, and he sang, uh, I can't remember, what's the name of the singer in Soft Cell? Mark Harmon. Mark Harmon. Mark Harmon. He did standards. He sang standards from what I mean. Oh, yeah, he does all those torch songs and things. Yeah, and yeah, that's it. Uh, I, 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 I don't remember much about the gig apart from being very disappointed with Fine. I put, put him on at the marquee um, mid mid eighties, and uh, for some, it may have been the twenty fifth anniversary year eighty three, and uh, he played at the marquee in the sixty. I mean, he'd been there, he'd been around, he straddled the uh, the decades. And uh, I had exactly the same issue with him. He was a miserable bastard and yeah. uh, he, he um, very unfriendly and wanted to count every ticket and, you know, uh, very suspicious of all the uh, accounting that, you know, we did at the cash desk. That's <laughs> probably why he gets on so well with Van Morrison. <laughs> yeah, <probably. laughs> well, yes. <laughs> yes, there's another one. Fortunately, oh. I never dealt with him, but my friend George McManus did. And he had, well, for, he, unfortunately, he's dead. He had some wonderful stories about uh, Mr. Morrison. And he actually came from Belfast, George. And he said, and this is, we've been working with him for several years. And he said, I went to one gig and he just ignored me. The whole of the gig. I went backstage, he wouldn't talk to me. It's a funny thing how Van Morrison uh, always kind of gets mentioned when we do one of these. Everyone's got a Van Morrison well, story. I, I think there's certain artists that are, are that way inclined, and that's it. They're not going to change. They don't. They're just arseholes, I guess. Did Nick? Did you ever do the the top of the pops with Cliff Richard and Van Morrison? I didn't. No. You weren't no. out because that, that's a that's another one with Van Morrison's story. Because Cliff, of course, being Cliff, he liked to drink, but as you know. 
he loved to drink, but Van Morrison loved to drink a lot more. And if ever you watch that version of the song, um, I can't what it's called. Whenever Dan, God shines his light. Whenever God shines your light, it's him and Van. You see Cliff like just doing his thing, but Van has got an inane grin on his face the whole way through it, I think, because he's so fucking pissed. <laughs> and that was the BBC bar for you, of course, which, yes. you know, a lot of you would know. 